Toma, how are you? Good to see you, man. You too, man. Long time no see. Yeah, you keeping well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been so busy uh, writing and uh, creating content and meditating on uh, Bitcoin that uh, I may have lost my mind or or been enlightened or one of the other things, but something's going on. Well, actual Bitcoin meditating? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to think about anything else. So when I'm meditating, usually some integrations come up that have something to do with Bitcoin, especially since I'm spending all my time writing about Bitcoin and creating content about it. It's, it becomes inescapable. Are you like... Uh... You're like Neo in the Matrix. Are you are you seeing Bitcoin how other people don't? I think I have. I'm having. I think a lot of people around the world are having interesting insights about Bitcoin that are new and fresh. And I think I'm having some of these insights too. And we all have them in our own unique personal way. Um, and that's why I try to write about some of these things because it may light a path for someone else to have a similar experience. They, again, their own unique one, but. Uh, it's like leaving breadcrumbs and saying, oh, if this was an interesting path down the rabbit hole I took, you might want to just pay a, a little visit here or there. Dude, you're in deep, man. <laughs> I know. What can <sighs> I say? Well, listen, Toma, you were known for writing these very nice, short, easy to digest Bitcoin snacks. And now you've yes. written a feast. You wrote a thesis. Uh, honestly, mm. I think it's your best work. Thank you so much. Um, I haven't really discussed, you're talking about this article, how Bitcoin is like a giant cybernetic metabrain in particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Honestly, it blew my mind. Like you told me about it last time. You said, Pete, yeah. you're like, I'm working on this idea about Bitcoin being a brain. I was like, I want to make that show. And right. uh, it's a lot to take in. It's a lot to take in. Like anyone listening. Piece. Yeah. Listen, anyone listening now. I recommend go down to the show notes and click on it and go and read it first, or at least at least read read the first few paragraphs to get like a feeling of what you're talking about. But this is a proper it's a proper long form article, dude. It's congratulations. It's so good. <laughs> well, thank you. I um, I and I will try for listeners to uh to to make a whole uh, discussion of it here if we want to try to synthesize it all so that they don't have to try to read the whole paper because. It's had, it's had a few thousand uh, people attempt to read it. I don't know how many people have gotten all the way through it. Um, and it's, it's actually gotten more applause than I expected because it's one of these medium articles. So that's, that's what you get. And uh, I'm glad that people have found it interesting because it's, it's one of these out there concepts. Right. So, oh man, where do I even start with this? Okay, look, firstly, so you had this thesis that Bitcoin is like a brain but you obviously had to then go and study brains and figure out how brains work and t talk to me about that. Yeah, it was actually a little bit backwards. Um, okay. I had it the other way. I had this, uh, I w before I started writing about Bitcoin, I was working for a company. I was running a company that was teaching brain science uh, and the skill of emotional intelligence to executives and doctors and nurses and engineers. And the way that we motivated the learning in all these science, technology, engineering, mathematics, st students, professionals to be interested in studying emotions and emotional intelligence was to teach them some brain science and talk about where the emotions take place in the brain and where thoughts take place in the brain. It was a very effective, um, it was a very effective product and a very effective course. And in the course of delivering that course and understanding that companies uh, knowledge. I learned a lot about the brain <laughs> and because uh, we were teaching our, our flagship product was called the science of emotional intelligence. And it, and half of the material was this brain science about how the brain works. So when I ended up leaving that organization, I had recently accumulated all this knowledge about how brains work. And in my various meditations about Bitcoin at the time that I was having this idea, I uh, I realized that, you know, we all, all Bitcoiners who have, especially ones who have full nodes, are carrying this identical piece of information, which is kind of like how every cell in a in an organism carries the same DNA, and we're all updating it, and we're all transmitting information back and forth to each other, which was kind of like what neurons, the, the brain cells, 
uh, do to one another. And the, the big epiphany moment came for me, uh, the, the big moment of crystallization or integration came for me when I said, well, when, when Satoshi left and there was clearly no leadership and no center, this then became Bitcoin's brain. Like so Satoshi may have been the father of Bitcoin or the guide of it initially, the um, God, but it took a, yeah, it, but it took a life of its own when he dis disappeared and like a brain, there's no one brain cell in your brain, which is where Peter McCormack is, there's, you know, the, your Peter McCormack isn't in any a bunch of these. It's, it's the effect of all these different brain cells transmitting information to one another that Bitcoin's personality, Bitcoin's identity, Bitcoin's living will emerges from, um, from this now really decentralized system that in this paper, I draw a lot of parallels between how the system works and how the uh, building blocks of brains work and are connected. And so that was kind of this moment for me that was, oh my God, there's something really similar between these two things. And there was this event that made them, uh, that made them so similar. And it helped me, and this was, this was months ago that I had this insight and so I think it really helped me then understand in ways that many people struggle to understand how things happen in Bitcoin, because people really struggle when you talk to them about Bitcoin. Well, how does it govern itself? Who's in charge? How do decisions get made? And you can't point to anyone, you can't say, well, Peter's in charge or Tomer's in charge or anybody's in charge. There's, there's all these things. And, and that's actually quite similar to and if you ask, how does your brain make a decision? There's no one brain cell that's in charge. There's all these different cells and sections and regions that are working with their own premises and their own emergent ideas. And at the end of the day, you end up having to make a decision uh, or hold an idea and, and it arises inside your brain in much the same way that we will have some consensus arise within the Bitcoin community or some debate. Uh, that it remains unresolved. Like, isn't the brain weird? Like, if you look at evolution, that like the marvel of evolution, like this mm -hmm. thing we can't explain that somehow life was sparked at the bottom of the oceans, and from that evolution came out of it. But like, if you really think about it, the um, it's like some marvels of evolution, like the eye, just trying to understand, just trying to understand the eye, for example. It's just like this unbelievable thing that you you can't even understand. How that that how that even happens, but th the thing about the brain that's completely different is that everything we've got is where consciousness exists. And trying to even understand what consciousness is itself, or where that is in the brain, or how that came to be, like why did consciousness become something we evolved to have? Like it's so weird. It's it's really there's a few amazing things that that question gets me to want to talk about. And I'll try to remember all of them. The first thing is, it's a common misconception that your brain is only in your head. Okay. Uh, your brain, wow. Your, your brain is, when we talk about a brain, we talk about all these neurons, right? The, the brain is just this network of neurons and, and neurons are nerve cells and the nerve cells run and they're all connected into your brain and they run right throughout your whole body. There's even a tiny little itty bitty brain um, which is a bigger cluster of nerve cells inside your heart. And when you feel something in your toes, that's, that's a part of your brain that's actually physically extended all the way down into your toes. So it's, it, it's your, your nervous system. Your brain is your nervous system. It's made out of nerve cells. Well, I can tell you something weird about that. Yeah. Yeah, because I had my back injury, right? Mm -hmm. And the weirdest thing about my back injury that made me realize how weird the body is, is that my... Uh, I had a herniated disc that's pressing on, uh, pressing on on the the part of the nervous system that goes through my back, and I had the operation. I'm repaired, but I've got this ongoing issue where I if I go running, I get a pain in the leg, but the pain is not in the leg. What's, there's no attack on the leg itself. The leg is fine. It's wherever the pressure is within the part of the spine in my back, is telling me there's a problem with my leg. So it's like a trick. Mm -hmm. You know, normally, yeah. like if I stick a like pin in my leg, there, it will identify pain there. But there's nothing actually yeah. wrong with my leg. The problems with the part of the uh, the nervous system that's in my spine, yeah, is so weird. Yeah, no, I I, I think of I I once had a fancy car, not as fancy as yours, 
and it had all these computers in it and it kept, and parts of it kept breaking down but like it was a convertible and the roof wouldn't go down because the car thought that the roof was overheated because it was an automatic roof but it was just the sensor that was the problem or it thought that the car was emitting too much carbon dioxide but it was just the sensor that was messed up and so the the car perceived as as you perceive pain in its roof or pain in its window or pain in its exhaust but it was really just a dysfunctional sensor a dysfunctional nerve cell if we're if we're analogizing and um and that seems unfortunate i'm sorry to hear that you're feeling pain where you actually don't have a dysfunction <laughs> but mm. i'm sorry to hear that you're you've, you've got this going on but um you know this this so first of all you've got you've got brain cells all throughout your body it's, that's not really kind of the uh the big and and profound difference maybe i'm losing my train of thought a little bit here well you're saying but but is it basically is the brain therefore the biggest organ in our body well, can you, th I, uh, people say that the skin, I, I've heard, like, I, again, I'm not, I'm not here, I'm not a brain scientist, and I'm not a doctor, and I'm not a physician. I've heard that the skin is, uh, you know, your epidermis is your, the largest organ in your body, because it, it covers the entirety of your body. But you can think of the brain as, as then your biggest internal or, organ, because it actually reaches out to every part of your body. And every time you feel something, that's not your skin that's feeling it, that's a nerve inside your skin that is feeling it and its nerves right inside your skin. So there's an inter integration between these things. And I, I think it's, it's useful to, to recognize that the same type of cells that cause you to feel stuff are the same type of cells that are in your head. Although it, this is another interesting point. If you, if you actually operate on somebody's brain and you poke their brain, they apparently don't feel anything. Uh, so, so the adaptation of the nerve cells depending on where they are is obviously serves a different purpose some transmit the sense of touch and taste and some trans and some do this thinking uh, they, they do this neural networking which is where our consciousness comes from and, and, and so this was your question <laughs> you were asking about where does consciousness come from and why do we have consciousness and i guess the two points i was going to make is the consciousness that we can see, that we can be certain of, right? Like we may not, there's a lot of people who have very different spiritual beliefs about what things are also conscious besides animals, but we can definitely see that animals are conscious, right? They are, they, they have sensory organs, they perceive things, and then they act uh, off of the basis of their integration of those things, which is what consciousness seems to have evolved for in that, in that sense for sure. And so, it, it, and then there's this amazing thing, which is how our consciousness integrates what the senses. Like out there is a bunch of light waves, photons, and there's vibrations in the air. That really isn't green. Like if I'm seeing the color, the color green, I perceive it as a color, but it's really just a frequency of light waves. And if I'm hearing your voice, there aren't words out there. There isn't music out there. There's vibrations in, in the air. But we end up appreciate, we end up experiencing these things as senses. And we often have even like a judgment, like that's a nice sound or it's a nice song or that tastes nice or that tastes terrible. So we, we also end up not just experiencing these things differently from how they probably are in nature, well, almost certainly from how they are at, at this raw level of nature, we end up experiencing them as sensations in a conscious e existence. And we often have the ability to either appreciate them or judge them in some way or, ju or judge them harshly. And that kind of is an interesting miracle in and of itself that all this objective boring the air is vibrating you know, there's light waves bouncing around that you can actually see that as something that you know or there's matter that touches your tongue you that you can say that's delicious to experience the universe as delicious or as melodic or as beautiful is is really is is another one of these extraordinary things like did consciousness have to evolve so that we could appreciate the universe but that we actually, we have that ability. I, you know, I don't know that a rock appreciates the universe, judges the universe as good or not. I don't know exactly if a plant does. I suspect that plants have some ability to say, oh, the sunlight, the water, that's really nice. Um, in whatever way, they, you know, they don't describe it in words. But we, we are able to really appreciate and enjoy the universe through the consciousness that we've evolved. 
and that's extraordinary. And you can appreciate the fact that you can appreciate the universe, which is this other level of abstraction. So it's it's really extra, it's really fortunate to be human. Yeah, I mean, there's things which are unique to us as human in that we are self-aware of our consciousness, which mm-hmm. I don't believe animals are aware of their own consciousness. And we also create art. And I know there's mm-hmm. like some elephants have been taught to paint and monkeys as such, but like we we are taught, we, we create and appreciate art. You know, we have yeah. deep emotional feelings. And I'm sure some people say, my dog's emotional, my cat's, but we have deep emotional feelings and we can talk about them. Like, all this stuff that's like been created is incredible. But the, the fact that the consciousness exists itself, to me, it's, you know, and that's, I guess, when some people are religious, they would they would say that is part of your soul or, or something. But the fact that it even exists, it, to me, is truly, that, that me here, Peter McCormack and you there, Toma, yeah. we know who we are. We're self-aware of who we are. Like, yeah. how, how does the... I don't even know. Look, I mean, I best, you know, one of the best things to do is like, you should probably just explain how the brain works because I read yeah. it, but I'd like to know how it works. Okay. Well, and this is, nobody knows exactly how the brain works. Like we don't actually know this is exactly how consciousness arises or it doesn't, but we can see the various workings of the brain and we can see that we, like we know that consciousness emerges somehow from the operation of the brain. We just don't know exactly uh, how it emerges from the brain. But what I, uh, what I do focus on in this article is the brain is made up of a lot of cells which are called neurons. And all neurons have a similar structure. And within their structure are these various parts. So I've just got the paper in front of me so that I don't... That's fine. Me. First of all, in the middle is, is what's called the cell body. And it's kind of like if people who are familiar with all other cells, they're it, it's where the nucleus is. It's where the DNA sits inside the n- nucleus. And so every cell in your body has a copy of your DNA. They're almost all identical, but there's events called mutations, which make you know one strand of DNA different. But inside of you is, inside every cell in your body is all the code that generates you, uh, all the genetic code that generates you, which is the d- DNA. Um, and that sits inside the nucleus of, uh, or within the cell body of every uh, neuron. What makes them different is they have these two other parts that reach out or, or receive the outreach from other cells. So they, they have this thing called an axon, which is like a long tail or a long arm with, uh, with axon terminals, which are like fingers that come out of it, but they, they'll have more than five fingers. It, it's like a network. They can have a thousand or more um, axon terminals. And, these, and, and then they have receptors called dendrites which is what the axon terminals of other neurons connect to. And so they form connections, and this is how neural networks exist. And, and the, the analogy that I, that I use is kind of like how we're, we, will be, we, will, we will be on Twitter and we will have people who follow us. And so those are people whose dendrites our axon terminals touch. And that means that when we send out a signal on Twitter, like a tweet, those people might receive that message, right? Our followers are, are people who we, we might send out a message to. And this is exactly what happens inside a neuron. A neuron has the ability to generate a, an electrical impulse. And when an electrical impulse is generated by a neuron, it goes down this axon to the axon terminals. And the space where axon terminals meet with dendrites, this is where the signal senders meet with the signal receivers of other cells is called a synapse, which is a word that most people have heard. And mm-hmm. the synapse is a little, ga- is a gap. Uh, it's got, it's got chemicals inside of it, but it's, it's a, it's physical space. And when that spark hits, when that action potential fires, when the electrical signal is sent, all three words for the same, uh, for the same event, it may cross the synapse and spark and connect to the other and, and cause an electrical connection in the recipient, um, neuron that where the axon terminal connected to the dendrite over an over a synapse and if that happens then there might be a change you know something else happens to the nerve cell that received the signal it will it won't always be received but it'll sometimes be received and whether or not it's received as a function of the shape of the electrical impulse how how close the synapse is what neurochemicals exist in there it's it's basically how much one cell is actually able to pay attention to another's signals and um 
and the brain is formed by <laughs> through these incredibly complex networks of cells. There, there isn't any one cell in your brain that's connected to all the others. Again, it's not centralized. Um, there, the, but many cells will be connected to many other cells. Cells might be connected in a loop in the same way that you follow someone and they follow you on a social network. You can have a round robin connection so that one cell can fire, send a signal to another and back and forth. Or we may be, to, cells may be connected through a bit of a daisy chain like Alice is connected to Bob, Bob is connected to Carol, Carol is connected back to Alice, so signals can feed back. And feedback is a very important part of the learning process. When a cell expects something and it sends a signal and it receives back a reaffirming signal, that's, that's what ends up happening. And, uh, and there's these really, really complex uh, connections that happen between neurons inside, inside a brain. But even just... Um, and maybe the, the last really important point is, of course, because each cell doesn't connect to itself, each cell is, has, is part of a unique, so it has its own unique connection graph, which contains it and the rest of, its other, uh, of the other cells in its graph. But when it fires, it, it causes different reactions. So there's, there really is this uniqueness. Each, each cell, like a snowflake, I say, is, is unique inside your brain. Acting in concert, your brain is all this net physical network of all these cells that have formed connections with one another. And I'll talk about how connections get formed or broken a little bit later on in this conversation, because just like on Twitter, when you can follow someone and block them and unfollow them, uh, these neurons connect, you know, the axon terminals will connect to dendrites of others and they will be reinforced or, they will, or these connections will break. And so your brain is just this continuous process of neurons firing electrical impulses that may or may not reach other neurons based off of their connections and the synaptic quality of that. And, and this electrical field is generated inside your brain by all these billions of cells continuously firing across these connections that they have. And I think it's somewhere in that process, that, that field that, that is shaped by the connections that's your conscious field, right? Like that's, uh, that's this idea of consciousness, why consciousness flows. Consciousness is not a static physical thing. It is an energy field, which is, you know, this energy field that's generated by all your neurons firing and, and it's, it's shaped by the shape of the network of your brain, uh, but it, it flows because it's this electrical flow. And so that's why you can't freeze your consciousness, it's constantly flowing. And people who meditate know this, right? You can't clear your mind. Uh, no matter how much you try, thoughts come up, patterns happen, and you can't snapshot a particular thought. You have to keep repeating it. A thought takes time. It's a process within your brain. So, so brains are really interesting <laughs> and consciousness yeah. is really interesting. And, uh, and, and it's fascinating. And, and, uh, I, I mean, I'm happy to continue to just kind of hang out on this particular part of the topic for a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I know we're not into the Bitcoin yet, but like, okay, so in terms of the brain, you say uh, the neurons are all the same, but they have different connections. Yeah. If you were to dissect different parts of the brain that were responsible for different things under a microscope, would it all look the same? Or do like, are they, it's like the different section of the brains is only different because of the way the connections are different. Like, I'm so fascinated by this. That's a great question. I, I think individual nerve cells are generally hard to tell apart. You know, some, some are longer and some are shorter. Like the, the nerve cells in your leg are the longest cells in your body. It turns out that they're, they're, your damaged ones potentially are like up to three feet long uh, because the axon, which is the tail part, is longer in some than in others. So you can differentiate them. But, it, but if I, and again, I'm not a brain scientist, so I may have this wrong, but in the different regions of your brain, the neurons are just organized differently rather than they're fundamentally different in their nature. Some nerve cells are obviously geared to react, and they're slightly modified to geared to react, geared to react to different things, like your optic nerve cells react to light, whereas your auditory nerve cells re react to some vibration. So there's there's evolutionary adaptations in some of these, but in the in the big major part of your your brain, um, things are, the, the, if you look at them under the microscope, I think that acts, that neurons generally look the same. 
So, so in doing all this research, what what are the like most amazing things that you discovered about the brain, which kind of blew your mind? I, I think for me, the it was really the similarities that I saw to how the Bitcoin culture was evolving. So, I, as I said, I was really educated about the brain through this previous role that I had. And I was learning a lot of really interesting things about it, about how apparently the, the neural connections that you use more frequently, uh, they develop, they get stronger. There's a process called myelination, which is like, a imagine like all the electrical uh, wires that we see around are all wrapped in plastic as an insulator. And, it, and myelination is kind of like this growing insulation around these things so that there's less leakage of signal. So thoughts that you have very often or connections that you have very often myelinate and they get insulated in a sense. And so this, I think, is also an interesting explanation of why people tend to have the same thought patterns over and over again once you, once you really start to establish a particular pattern of thought it becomes entrenched and and that's uh, through this um, this process called myelination. I think there's just, there's so much complexity to the brain. And in this article, I really tried to simplify it just to that part, which I could then easily draw connections to, to how we as individuals communicate within the Bitcoin ecosystem. Uh, but there's, I mean, there's just, there's so much fascinating stuff about the brain and and perhaps one of the most interesting things about it is just how little we still understand about it like we can take mm. pictures of it and we tend to learn a lot about it from people who suffer from brain injuries because we don't go in and cut off parts of people's brains or damage people's brains but there are people who have these brain injuries that prevent them from forming new memories or people who have brain injuries that um, cause them to um, I'm trying to think of some of these other interesting things. One of the most interesting things I actually did remember learning about the brain, and I hadn't prepared to remember the name of the book, but the book is called On Intelligence. And it, the author is the guy whose name I forget, but he was a Silicon Valley pioneer. He created Palm Pilot. And he really, he was studying brains to try to understand where artificial intelligence might come from. And the biggest and most interesting thing that uh, came out of that is how important feedback loops are inside the brain. Like if you expect to see something, when you take an action and you take that action and then you see the result, that reinforces a learning. And if you see something different than what you expected, then you know that you have made a mistake. And I think that's really, that's a really important thing in terms of learning, right? Like that's objective learning. If you expect something and you do it and you don't get the expected results, you should modify your thinking. And as opposed to just try harder, right? There, there's that great, saying that says Insan the definition Einstein. of insanity. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. And yet we see so much of it in the world today. Um, and a good a system with good feedback that listens to the feed a system needs feedback to know when it's making a mistake. And that's a big part of what your brain is designed to be. And we'll see when we talk about Bitcoin if it's got similar attributes. Well it is it kind of incredible how much we don't know about the brain, especially as we're mm -hmm have uh, technical people these days trying to build AI and synthetic, uh, well, t like uh, computerized neural networks. And right. uh, we're trying to put people on the moon and we're trying to harvest energy from the sun and we've yeah. created CRISPR and we can do DNA sequencing. But yet there's still so much about the brain we just don't understand. Yeah. Well, maybe the last the last thing that we'll say, it, it, you know, a single, a single neuron has some capacity to do some mental processing. There are creatures that have, you know, a single neuron. We had to evolve, just like we evolved from single-celled animals to multi-celled animals, consciousness or intelligence or whatever arises from neural, the neural cell uh, developed into having multiple neurons. And that's where this advanced complexity of consciousness and perception and sensation and conception eventually evolved evolved into. But you know, when we talk about neural networks, most of these neural networks are built with like less than 10 simulated neurons. And your brain has billions of neurons. So the capacity of what our brains are doing to create consciousness is still so many orders of magnitude, more complex and parallel than these most advanced neural networks. But when we see these neural networks being trained for very specific tasks, like playing chess or playing Go, 
for you, optimizing something that a neural network optimizes for. It takes very, very few neurons, very few virtual neurons to be able to do better than the best human being can with a brain with billions of neurons. So our, our brains are obviously constructed to, to, towards a different purpose. We didn't evolve to play the game of Go, unlike Google's very small system that mm. was able to play Go a trillion times against itself and figure out how to optimize for that. And it, it remarkably requires very few neurons to get that intelligent um, in, a con in a narrow context, that powerful in a narrow context. So again, another really fascinating, the more neurons we have, it's not so much that we're stupider, but we're more generalized and, and conscious. <laughs> so I, I don't think Google's uh, Go playing machine is actually conscious. It's just, it's automatically wired to just use feedback to continuously get better at playing Go. And then we get to the ethical question when we create AI, does it ever have consciousness? And well, we, we have, created uh, Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has consciousness. Does it? Does Bitcoin have consciousness? I'm not sure it does. And does Bitcoin have? Mm, that's a good question. I need to think about. Need to think that one through. Okay. So, how did you start connecting this to Bitcoin? Like, what was that eureka moment where you're like, "This is like a brain." It's so funny. Um, I was trying to orange pill somebody in particular. I was trying to orange pill this guy who was the founder of the company that I had been working for, who lectured on brain science to companies like IBM and the Federal Reserve and um, all these pharma companies because they were our big clients. And I kept trying to explain to him how decentralization works. And he was really struggling with the idea, which because it's a very complicated idea. It's not something that people really understand. And But I knew he understood brain, brain science because he was teaching it. And so just, uh, I guess, on some walk that I was having through the forest and meditating on how I'm going to orange pill this one person in the world, I started to connect this the similarities that I outlined in the paper between what neurons do and how they connect with each other and how they communicate with each other and what plebs do and how they communicate with each with each other. Mm. And, and there was, uh, there, and I was kind of building this um, framework. And I was, I was talking about it to this person, I was talking about it to somebody else. And then I, I think for me, the last piece of it fell with, with this realization that this system became completely independent of any central control, like a brain is when Satoshi vanished and that now there was no longer any any one place you could look at this thing and say well that's where the control lies it just it's it's distributed it's everywhere at mo different moments in time control takes place in in the more active portions of of this network and that's and that's very much like the brain so then i then i sat down to try to connect all of these uh, all of, all of these dots and say does it hold up and to what extent is it just a model and to what extent it, does it seem to be reasonably accurate and what are its implications? Okay, so so what falls within the remit here of the brain uh, nodes and miners, but also it's not just the protocol itself. You also talk about mm -hmm. and I know people say well, there isn't a Bitcoin community, but like okay, whatever the the people who are active Bitcoiners, yeah, they're part of this. Yeah. Are companies part of this? Is it literally anything that's part of this? If, however far you want to take the analogy, you can actually go a lot further than I do, I do in the paper. But in the paper, I, I'm just trying to build up the basic building blocks. And in the basic building blocks, I'm saying we, the plebs, people who actually run nodes, or at the very least stay connected within the Bitcoin community and receive messages and transmit messages and form a part of the consensus, are forming a part of the brain. And they're forming a part of the consciousness that is in Bitcoin. So in the same way that, you know, I, the way the way I might liken th this example in, in a simpler example than what I provide in the paper is like you have a you have some nerves in your brain that are connected to your optic nerve or are part of your optic nerve. So they see something directly and then they retransmit it to some other part of your brain, the part that you actually think you see something in. Um, is not directly making contact with the light. It's it's retransmitted messages that are now forming the sensation, the perception in, in your mind. And I kind of view this, like there's a bit of price movement going on in Bitcoin now. And I'm aware of this, not because I checked the price. I'm just, I'm, I'm on Twitter 
And on Twitter, there's a bunch of people sending messages like, oh, look, the price is up or a meme of a of a guy holding a green candle, slicing a red bull in half or a red bear in half. And so there's all these messages that are being transmitted from all these other neurons in the community that are sending a signal to me and, and the rest of the brain saying there's some price action right now and I don't have to sense it directly myself. And this to me is just kind of one of these simple things about how uh, consciousness spreads how an, how mm. an idea spreads the the more interesting thing is how the bitcoin ma- hive mind thinks uh how does it actually process so how does it process a problem and and i i cite an example of that in the paper like i said like we when the when all the energy fud started there wasn't we didn't hire a consultant or form a committee to solve to to rebut the energy fund. Well, well, actually, that's not exactly yeah. true, is it? Because Sailor did form the Bitcoin Mining Council. Well, that's so that so that's one thing with the Mining Council. But the Mining Council actually. So I, I'm saying, in terms of addressing, long before Sailor for, Sailor participated in forming the Mining Council, which is about more than just the energy fund. Yeah. Um, Nick Carter did a lot of research and published a bunch of articles, and I published a short article. My mine was nowhere near as influential as any of his stuff, but actually, Michael Saylor did share my <laughs> the article that I wrote, which which is a retransmission and a, and a distribution to other nodes, and other people made note of it, and someone turned my my article into a short video, which got retransmitted on TikTok, which got spread out there. So what what I'm trying to say is there is this decentral any and anyone could write an article I see, I see what you're saying. and anyone can have any insights and the and gradually what happens in this feedback loop is people say you know this argument holds merit this thing about oh all, all and you know it's it's moving to the cheapest energy which is actually renewable energy it's it's recapturing stranded energy it's doing this it's doing that and we end up with this synthesis of the valid ideas and the compelling ideas that we all end up in harmony with at the end of the day, anyone who's paying attention to the issues. So we get this free form thinking that any neuron in the system can introduce new information, bad information gets rejected by being contradicted, good information gets amplified and distributed throughout the brain. And then at the end of the day, we end up with this decentralized distribution of valid information and no distribution or very limited distribution of invalid information, which is very different than a corporation that would work a top down or a government that would work top down and say, well, we hired a consultant. The consultant said, this is the answer. And now everybody follow suit and everybody's directed to follow suit. No, yep. Again, there's nobody in the Bitcoin community who can be forced to hold any particular view by anybody else. There's no authority. There's no hierarchy in the system. So th- this is, I yep. think, what helps... It helps in a couple of dimensions, right? It helps us to better understand decentralization when we think about how things work in our brain or in a brain. And it helps us to realize how decentralization actually (laughs) works in Bitcoin and that there's a similarity here. So even if it's only a reasonable model and Bitcoin isn't actually conscious, which we could have a fun discussion about, it's a very useful way to see how we as conscious participants in the Bitcoin community end up processing ideas and and coming to conclusions. Yeah, it's interesting because it makes me think uh, of anything I've seen where whether it's a documentary and they're studying the brain and you know, they will ask certain kind of questions or try and trigger certain emotional responses and, and the brain scans will say, well, this part of the brain lit up. But also this little bit here also lit up. And, you know, when yeah. you talk about, say, like price action, it could be, you know, the area of the brain, which is the people who are big traders, it really lights up. But then maybe people who are developers, it only lights up a little bit because like right. they're less bothered. They, you know, see so the analogy works. Yeah, yeah. When we had the taproot activation exercise, not everybody was interested in it. So a lot of parts of the brain were dormant, but there were core developers who got really interested in it and they wanted to have a safe activation and a peaceful activation. And there were those of us who were very active in the user activated soft fork fork wars. And we wanted to activate with another user activated soft fork. And, you know, and there were two parts of the brain that were lit up and we had these discussions and debates and this dialogue. And at the end of the day, if, (laughs) if you recall, or even know what happened is like, both a UASF client was released and the speedy trial client was released. And both Mm -hmm. parties said, we want to see the speedy trial succeed. The party that also released the UASF client said, and we want 
it to succeed in part because everybody knows that there's the threat of a UASF to make it happen. So it wasn't like the whole thing came out. And again, there was a committee meeting and there, and there was consensus. There was, there was various regions of the brain that serve different purposes. It's almost like, you know, you've got a part of your brain that's your fight or flight reaction. And you've got the part of your brain uh, that is, that is your <laughs> cerebral cortex with your neocortex, which does all the thinking. And the two can be in conflict at times and you need some resolution. And, and this is maybe a similar analogy. I don't want to characterize one camp as the other. I, I was, I was talking to, de to developers who might be very, per very well um, labeled as the rational, calm, careful aside, and the UASF people who, who I also was talking to and, and participating with, who were the emotional um, fight or flight, like we got to make sure that we're ready to fight side. And we ended up with, with a peaceful resolution, but not because one side could control and command the other. It was just the overall waiting. And there was this conscious process of going back and forth. And that, and that's what I argue. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying that your node is conscious and it's aware. I'm saying this meta entity, which is the whole of the Bitcoin community that acts in, not in unison, uh, because we all make the same decisions, but acts as a unified whole as it shares these ideas and thinks about them, exhibits something that's very similar to consciousness. It takes in information from the outside world, it processes it, it makes sense of it, and it takes external action. And that's consciousness. Hmm. Okay. So, so explain to me what part the nodes are. So the nodes are the neurons. Well, the, no, the nodes are actually like the DNA. In, you're the neuron. I'm the neuron. Okay. Uh, and and, and we, we contain a node, and the node is the DNA. And, and the interesting thing about it contains the, our DNA, the Bitcoin DNA contains two really important things. It contains the code that are the mm -hmm. laws of Bitcoin. And it, the consensus, contains yeah. the, and it contains the blockchain, which is the state of Bitcoin, who, who has what money. And we're all in complete agreement on all of that. I'm in agreement that you have half a Bitcoin and that I got a tenth of a Bitcoin. And, and so you're in agreement. It's not, there's no disagreement about the rules and there's no disagreement about the stakes that everybody has. And that creates a particular alignment that doesn't exist in other communities that use Twitter, for example. So in the paper, I have this one moment of skepticism, which says, well, isn't the phenomenon that you describe true of any community on on Twitter or on social media. And I point out, actually, it isn't. Those communities are continuously fragmenting and falling apart and people are arguing and there's no resolution and there's no consensus. It's, I, you know, I will wear a mask. I won't wear a mask. I will wear two masks. I will force you to wear a mask. I will not wear a mask. And we just witness everything um, fracturing and shattering into pieces. Whereas in Bitcoin, we notice more and more people coming in and more consensus being built over time, even though we have arguments from time to time, but the arguments rarely lead to any shattering or departure of any people. And if they do, they leave via hard fork. They break the consensus rules, right? They, they actually leave the organism. They, they, they mutate out of being Bitcoiners. They become B-cashers or whatever other chain people Bullshit. fork off on, <laughs> right? Um, and, but within the Bitcoin community, we end up having to have a lot, we, we end up, no matter how much I disagree with you about any one particular topic, we have zero disagreement about the rules of Bitcoin and who has what, how much Bitcoin at what address. And so we're, and we each, because we have a stake in, in the system, if we hold Bitcoin, which we all do, we want to preserve and protect that and make it as valuable as possible. So we are all allied, like all the cells in an organism, right? Like if the whole organism dies, shit, we all lose a lot. And so we're all ultimately more interested in the preservation of the system and able to find common ground and cooperation than people who just have an idea that they don't want the virus versus somebody else who has a view that the virus doesn't even exist versus someone else who now has a view that the virus can't be controlled or that it can with a mask or that it can with a vaccine or like every other community just keeps fracturing and fracturing. The Bitcoin community keeps growing and growing and growing and getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Mm. And, and when I wrote this paper months ago versus now, it's like, wow, Bitcoiners are even so much tighter now than they were before. And it's taking on a, 
a deeper meaning to people than just getting rich. Yeah. So it's the it's the DNA, which is the consensus rules and the uh, blockchain, which is yeah. what, what ties us all together. And even if we are in disagreement, that thing we can't disagree on because that's, right. yeah, so interesting. But like there can be slight difference. So I don't understand this. Uh, you'll know, you might know this, but can, is the DNA in every single cell that our body has exactly the same? Or can no. there be slight differences from cell to cell? We're inferior to Bitcoin, right? Because a mutation takes place. So no, because there's different versions of the nodes, right? Uh, you can you can still operate old versions of the nodes. Yes, but they're but they're all going to end up in the in identical consensus on state, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the blockchain is the same, and because the miners are all enforcing all the rules. Okay. If you're not, if you're if you're running an old version, you're not going to be getting blocks sent to you that um, that your version might be exploited by because the miners are all mining the latest. So even if you're even if you've got some weaker rule that might allow like a SegWit transaction to be anyone can spend, you're not ever going to receive a block that contains a SegWit transaction that wasn't spent with a segregated witness signature mm -hmm. because no miner is mining that. Okay, so. A hard fork is possible within Bitcoin. That, that is a possibility. We know if we want to increase the block size at some point in the future, that's something that might happen. Who knows? Would you consider that gene editing? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, or, 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 you know, or some kind of mutation, but, uh, but it's fine to call, <laughs> to call it a gene. Now, I'm not really that focused on what genes are and what they mean mm. inside of this analogy to a brain. I'm, I'm more focused on that higher level structure from which tr uh, different nodes within it send and receive messages to one another, which generates consciousness inside of it. So I would almost want to say, I'm not, I don't really want to weigh in on if, 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 if it's like, if a node is like genes and if, if a hard fork is like gene editing, cause I haven't really thought much about what the right analogies are there. Kind of works for me. Okay. Let me try this one. Is Bitcoin SV, is that a brain hemorrhage? <laughs> <laughs> it's like when you insert shit right into the human brain and, and yeah. subs, it's called having shit for brains. <laughs> like I don't, I, Do you know I what it is? Know. It's like, it's, it's like Dolly the fucking sheep. But they try and clone. They try and clone it, but yeah. like eventually it it gets it gets all like fucked up and dies, right away, pretty much. Yeah. I, yeah. No, but I think I think that's actually so. I as much as we're somewhat joking, I think you're actually right. It's like when you take if you and I were to do some gene editing on each other or on ourselves, we would probably die, right? Like yeah. the because we don't have a fucking clue what we're doing, and so we're we're likely to insert some piece of code that's just going to lead to fatal. Death. And uh, when you have somebody who can't code and who lies about everything, make a gene edit. Yeah, it, it, it's no surprise that, that that the lack of understanding of what's... And even gene editing is a dangerous thing to do because who presumes, even someone who wears a white smock and has five years of university study and three PhDs, and like, who's to know exactly what happens when you edit the gene, right? Like, it, the unintended consequences or unknown realities about the thing are pretty serious and so we have you know when we do any kind of soft fork even it's vetted so so carefully because it will propagate throughout the whole network by really good developers in a decentralized manner right anyone can show up anyone can critique anyone can attack anyone can is free to demonstrate that there's something wrong nobody has authority to say turn a blind eye to something that somebody raises Right, so that's the Bitcoin brain working to adapt itself in that decentralized manner. In Bitcoin SV or Bitcoin Cash or any of the hard forks, there's one or two or three guys, right? And yeah. they say we're doing this, and I'm making the change. And and the Bitcoin developers, they like their review of these change recommendations are LOL at best, right? Or like this is a disaster because this is not the way this thing works. But those people are able to proceed in those venues. And, and so this is why I distinguish Bitcoin from all these other things, even the things that are very close copies of Bitcoin. They lack the decentralization, which is the key feature in the brain-like characteristic or the brain-like the brain -like model being applicable. The minute that you have one neuron in charge of all the others, it's no longer like a brain in biology. 
It's mm. something different. It's like a hierarchy. It's like a business. Right. So, so if we're the neurons yeah. and the consensus and the blockchain is essentially yeah, the DNA within that, what, what, where are miners within your brain analogy? Um, well, so my, miners also run nodes, so they're also a special kind of cell. And they, they're, they're doing, they're, they're in a sense beyond the brain. They're this metabolic function. Are they stem is, cells? <laughs> uh, no, I, 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 think, I, think that, I think that Bitcoin has many organs. Um, and, and so Ooh. when we... Are we going bigger now? At, yeah. Well, it, Bitcoin keeps developing abilities as it gets older. Right, it develop it develops certain defenses, it develops certain capabilities, and so it's kind of like it it was very young and very embryonic in the early days, and it needed a parent to take care of it, who was Satoshi, for a couple of years, and then Satoshi could leave, and then it was left independent, all on its own, to grow abilities, and it develops certain defenses, <laughs> like the like the toxic maximalists, right, who are there to defend any attempted attack on the integrity of the system and and its rules, which is like. It's a, it's it's developed a toxic gland, right? It, mm. it, it's able to be poisonous to attacks mm. on its integrity. So so it it's 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 developed the ability to be poisonous to things that want to harm it. And I, I think this is where really interesting phenomenons happen, right? And that when it develops the mining capability, so the miners are it's developing a bigger stomach, right, or a bigger ability to harness energy an animal would go out into the world and seeks energy it eats other things and it absorb or it absorbs energy from the sun if it's a plant and bitcoin whatever kind of thing you want to liken it to is increasing and growing in its capacity to go out into the world and consume energy it uses some of that energy to feed its brain cells which which then do some thinking as well but it's all part and parcel of this mega organism uh, that is that is Bitcoin. So that's why, like, I'm tr I try to be careful yeah. to say at the beginning of the paper, you know, like Brandon Quidham has likened Bitcoin to mycelial network, and Gigi has said it's alive. And I'm saying here, I'm actually focusing on one organ within this living entity that keeps developing new skills, and it's it's grown a brain, which is kind of interesting. I, and I, and I love the ability that this brain has, this kind of consciousness, and that it can think. I mean, I often thought as Bitcoin having an, an immune system, yeah, mm -hmm. and as an immune response to certain types of attacks, which get stronger as well. You know, yep. the first forks, you know, it wasn't prepared for those kind of attacks. It is now the FUD, you know, it wasn't prepared for those attacks, but now it's learned. You know, mm -hmm. so if somebody is making an attack on Bitcoin related to, say, let's say, terrorists or energy, you know, as the brain learns, it can respond to that quicker. It doesn't have to go away and research, you know. Yeah. Kind of lights up as we said, and it can respond, you know. So, like, it's such a fast like the more you think about it itself, the more fascinated it becomes. So, but what is the use of this thesis? Because, like, if, well, I'm, I'm, I'm asking that question, but also kind of knowing the answer because you answered it at the start. You said it's a good way to explain decentralization because that is, that is a tough concept to explain to people, like, mm -hmm. because it's like, when people are like, what is Bitcoin? You're like, well, it's, it is money, but it's this, it's that, it's digital gold. But really, like what it really is, is it is a decentralized form of money. And when you try and explain what decentralization is to people, that's kind of hard. I'm, I'm going to have to try this one out, Tom, and come back and report okay. to you. Wait, so, so let me try to toss a couple of things. There, yeah. There's a terrible acronym, Decentralized Autonomous Organization, which, which, which is good up until it gets to the word organization, and certainly not good once people have tried it in practice on other chains, but Bitcoin is a decentralized autonomous entity. Um, mm. and, and it is de decentralized and in a sense it is autonomous because there's nobody in charge of autonomous just means it drives itself in a sense, right? It steers itself and there's no one person steering it. There's no central body steering it. If to the extent that it's steered at all, it's steered through a collective consciousness of, uh, of everyone in the Bitcoin community choosing to move the steering wheel but for the most part it it just drives the thing drives itself like as i wrote in another article which i which i might mention it's like bitcoin is a technology that does not allow you to adjust it but it adjusts itself 
Thank you very much, right? Like every two weeks, Bitcoin adjusts its difficulty based off of everything that's happening in the world. And if you make an adjustment to your version of the source code to change the difficulty adjustment algorithm, you're just going to get booted off the network. You're going to get rejected from the organism. Um, and so you don't need to touch it. I don't need to touch it. It needs to be adjusted, but it does the self-correction. Well, that, that also is like a living thing. Right. Mm. Like, the, you know, we, we've come to this view that we need doctors to adjust everything, but we have immune systems, which is what you were talking about. We have adaptability, right? If you're lifting 10 pounds more over a couple of days, your muscles get stronger. And if you stop using them, your muscles get weaker. Well, that's that's like the difficulty adjustment in in Bitcoin. If we're taking on more energy, we just make it harder uh, so that the blocks keep running at the same pace. So everything in the system's kind of self regulating and, and self-adjusting and it's decentralized and autonomous and we can see these phenomenon much better in nature than we can in human made entities we see it much like bitcoin's a lot more like an organism than it is like a company or like a government in the in this sense yeah got no ceo no employees right <laughs> and everything that's a part of it is incentivized to be a part of it. it's very survival depends on it being a part of it it's so fascinating, Toma. You're, like I say, you, it, it, I think this is your greatest work. Your previous uh, writings, as I said, you, you did that thing where you wanted to write things that people could read in two to three minutes and learn something, mm -hmm. bite-sized chunks, and they're useful. But this is this is like a whole thesis where it, I keep, the more I think about it, I step back and I realize something else about it. I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, because it does this. Ah, oh, yeah, because it, where do you go with this next? Like, do, do you think this might evolve and you will go on to think of Bitcoin more of an organism and separate the parts which are maybe which is the brain or the separate organs yeah you think that's like a, a potential evolution of this in, in my in my mind personally this is not mm. to speak of my writing in my mind personally i see bitcoin as a i see bitcoin as a living thing and i see mm. i see it as a as a living creature that i have a relationship with that is a symbiotic relationship we each benefit from from one another i do what i can for bitcoin being a part of Bitcoin is beneficial to me. And, and the, the example I use is like, you know, we didn't know for thousands of years, well, we, did, we didn't know until a few hundred years ago, so however long human beings have been around, less a few hundred years, that microorganisms existed. We didn't, mm -hmm. And we didn't know that our bodies were made out of cells which contained our DNA until even more recently. Um, and so there was all this life around us and we weren't aware of its existence at all. And when the ger theory of the existence of germs until people developed microscopes and saw a whole other universe of life there, it was like, a, it was shocking. People didn't believe it at first. And so I'm proposing that in addition to microorganisms, which we haven't seen, there may be things out there that are macroorganisms that are hard for us to see with it because, because they're so big and their timeline is so different from ours that we just can't relate to their consciousness. And, and I think Bitcoin is this example, like it exists, it consumes energy, it grows, it has a risk of dying, but it's very robust and, and is very, like, it's going to live a lot longer than any of us, right? But, but it needs us to be a part of it. So it's kind of like you're made out of cells, every cell in your body is going to die nine times during your lifetime, or even more, right? 10, hopefully in your case, even longer, right? The, the longer. Because it's like every seven years, every single cell in your body is replaced. So every single human being who's a Bitcoiner will die, but Bitcoin will still be around because every other, because they'll be replaced by other human beings, which are other cells. And it, and the more you look at it from a lens of it's lifelike, it may not have every single identical component because it's using, it's using computer technology, not just organic technology. But when you look at us as a part of Bitcoin, um, it's just the same as if you look at humanity as as an organism that's existed for hundreds of thousands of years, and it's made up of humans, um, and the humans breed, and they and they make more humans. That humanity continues and goes on, hopefully, and uh, and that's another that's another mega organism, meta or macro organism mm. that we don't really up, tend to appreciate. But in the same way that a neuron in your brain might not be fully aware of the brain or your existence, but it needs it to, it needs it to stay alive. Mm -hmm. Like we as human beings need humanity to stay alive. And those of us who choose to become Bitcoiners also benefit from and participate in the organism that is Bitcoin. That's a rapidly evolving organism, evolving much more rapidly than mm -hmm. humanity. And may actually, <laughs> it may actually lead to an accelerated evolution of 
humanity. That's not human beings. But if Bitcoin solves the problem of civil, human civilization, which is humanity collapsing and regressing all the time, because the reason civilization collapses is because money keeps getting debased and money collapses. And so people's communication and peaceful coordination with each other collapses. And Bitcoin, if Bitcoin fixes that, which many of us believe it will, it will be an evolutionary leap forward for the being that is humanity. It's a really good place to finish it. <laughs> but I, I do want to ask you something else. We should yeah. also say something now for uh, all the people who are following on YouTube. Uh, there might mm. be someone listening who there might be a sound difference. They're probably going, what the fuck happened halfway through? So listen, anyone who's listening or watching, uh, I had massive Wi-Fi issues when we were trying to record this the first time and it kept cutting out. So we gave up halfway through. The next time we could do this is like me here in Miami <laughs> because I couldn't get my internet fixed while I was there. So this is why we we split. But before we finish, Toma, one thing I do, just can you plug your film? Because you made yeah. this brilliant film, Bitcoin is Generational Wealth. It's fantastic. Uh, uh, so just just do a plug. T tell people what that's about, where they can go and watch that as well. Yeah, so if you, if, if you go to your favorite search engine or YouTube, uh, and type in Bitcoin is generational wealth, you'll end up on this video, uh, which is a 15 minute, uh, 15 minute movie that uh, is, it's, <laughs> I've gotten some flack over it. It's not a documentary. It's a, it's a piece of science fiction uh, and it's a, and, it, and what it, what it, uh, what we made it to do is to explain how Bitcoin changes the game and, and makes for um, generational wealth preservation to be possible. And we wanted to concretize, not just to talk about that in abstract terms, but to show what life might be like in the future uh, now that we don't have to confront civilization collapse over and over and over again. And so it, it, it spans like a 150 year, 170 year time period that begins in 1948 and goes all the way to the year 2109, projecting what things might be like with Bitcoin in the world now. And it's, uh, and a lot of people have been deeply touched by it, which mm. is really um, it's, I, I don't know, really, that's, that's, the, that's the reward from it, right? To know that I've helped Bitcoiners see not just what they're fighting against, which, which everyone can see, but a little bit of what we're working for. And, mm -hmm. and that's been really the, the best part of this thing. Well, there's a whole show we could make around that subject alone. Uh, which yeah. we probably should do. We probably should do. We sure. should try and find a. We should try and find a time to do one in person. I need to get myself uh, down to uh, well, I say down up to your neck of the woods. Yeah, we're so close now. So close. <laughs> so whenever, close. whenever you're ready, yeah. I'll I'll find you a good steak here too. Dude, I'm not allowed to eat steak for two months. The doctors told me. Oh, what about uh, seafood then? <clears throat> uh, I'm not allowed shellfish. For, I'm not allowed shellfish or steak for two months. Oh, well, I'm gonna have one steak a month for the next two months. My um, cholesterol's got way too high. Okay. All Turns right. out that a carnivore diet isn't too healthy, apparently. Well, you haven't had a heart attack yet, is what the carnivores will tell you, right? Well, so he, still... he'll say it's coming. He said, uh, he said my uh, cholesterol's way too high, so I'm allowed one steak a month for the next two months. But maybe I'll save that one for you, dude. All right. Okay. I uh, and I. I can make you a nice mushroom risotto if, if you prefer. Well, I could do that as well, man. <laughs> I'm do just whatever. trying to entice, entice a face-to-face -face meeting. But we got to do it. Listen, we're we're moving to uh, trying to get back to like all our interviews in person. This is why we're here in Miami. We're setting up a studio mm -hmm. here. We're doing seven interviews in God, five days, four days. We're doing seven interviews in four days. Then we're going to do two in DC and then eight in New York. And that gives us six weeks, which is cool. That's great. So we're trying to get to that point. Uh, so, well, when you're in New York, um, I'm really close. And if, you know, if you're not able to come here, and if you do want to get together, I I could maybe come there. We will figure it out. We will. We will. We will figure it out. That it, you know, we're going to split ourselves between. I think we're going to have ourselves places in that we'll go to in New York, Miami, Texas, and LA. They're going to be like the four hubs. Where we yeah. know we can go and and people are flying like we've got Brandon Quitten flying in to do an interview with us, which is going to be cool. There you go. So people are willing to do it. So yeah, we can do that, man. We yeah. can do that. Well, listen, I'm glad we finished this out, brother. This is uh, amazing. <laughs> Anyone listening, go into the show notes and go and read this article. It's 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 like a mind bender. It's a, it's like up there with some of those like ones that Breed loves done, where you've like really got to sit back and 
get your phone out of the way so you're not distracted and don't because you can't just read it because you get to different sections you have to think you go hmm okay gonna kind of get your head around it but listen you've done great work what, what, what what's coming up next what are you working on now i want to do more films um okay. i'm constantly writing articles but now that i've seen like with a film like generational wealth it's gotten it's been out a couple of weeks or a few weeks and it's gotten 120,000 views already. Amazing. My articles, you know, a great article will get like 2,000 views. Like occasionally I've had some that maybe get tens of thousands of views, but that's only because they cover some really controversial topic. When I write thought pieces like this or in, or interesting pieces like that, a few thousand is all I can get. And here with the film, I was able to actually reach a hundred times as many people maybe or Amazing. 50 times as many and really emotionally connect and there's stuff that i'm working on right now that really is taking my meditations on bitcoin to the next level like how why does it why does it invoke and stir and arouse spiritual journeys in so many people and moral exploration in so many people and i've got some really interesting things about that and uh, just my continued admiration of <laughs> that story of Satoshi Nakamoto and the, and different pieces of that that I'm working on. So I, I'm all over the map, still trying to figure out exactly if I specialize at some point between doing Bitcoin philosophy, Bitcoin analysis um, about how it works, uh, Bitcoin ish on morality, Bitcoin on spirituality, bi what it means to be a Bitcoiner. Like these are all areas that I'm dabbling in and and finding myself going deeper and deeper into mm. and and it, it i'm i'm being rewarded for for it by seeing a following uh develop and and just there's the reward of actually occasionally having these interesting insights about bitcoin that may be new or that i can at least share with other people who haven't heard them before and that that's a really fun place to be because it's right at the edge of the frontier of this new horizon that we're all exploring yeah. together well you got a great name meditations on bitcoin is yeah. could be a book it could be a film series i feel like it mm -hmm. could be something you like i put on and go to the gym and listen to but you've definitely got a brand that kind of like that i like the idea of a meditation on bitcoin but like i don't know man you'll figure it out but yeah i love this dude okay well let's let's get together again let's get together in person Let's uh, cover good. Bitcoin as generational wealth. We can do that. Like, I've got so many trips coming up. We can, we'll find a time to do it. So, are you coming to the That's conference? Great. Are you coming to? I do plan on coming to the conference. I'm very excited. This will be my first uh, Bitcoin conference. And uh, oh, wow. I, I ended up writing a bunch of things about the last one just from watching it at a distance. So, to experience it firsthand is going to be really meaningful for me. Well, we could, we can probably, we can probably do something then. I mean, I'm going to be in for the whole week. And I'll okay. have my producer here and we'll have all, all our equipment set up. So maybe that's when okay. we'll do it, man. We could, yeah. we could I'll probably be it. there a couple of extra days. We'll, well. Make it, we'll make it work then. It's exciting. I right, Toma, it's uh, in British time, it's 3.47 in the morning. So uh, it's, it's going to be bedtime exactly for me. Yeah. No, Fair I'm on. a little bit jet lagged. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to bail now and get some sleep. But I'm glad we finished this off. It's fascinating. Like I said. Me too. Thank you for having me on again, Peter. Anytime, I really man. appreciate it, man. Anytime. I, I got you, dude. I, I love your work. I think you're brilliant. So just keep doing it. Thank you so much. Stay in touch. And uh, let's see what people think of Bitcoin and the brain, man. For sure. For sure. Okay. Well, have a great sleep. Be well. Peace out.